Yes, I make you a co-host. Both of you, I think Dominic earlier already test the screen and uh, Rain, you can go ahead. You can yes. Work on it. Thanks. So Dominic, are you sharing your screen? Maybe you can test uh, sharing your screen first and then I will share my screen. All right, okay, thanks. Actually, you already test, but you have already Actually, tested. I think I didn't test oh, before, okay. but uh, let's quickly test it right yes. now. Mm -hmm. We only tested the audio, so you should now see something from my slides. Yeah, dark matter, dark sector. Okay, good. So the title slide. Okay, thank you. So I will share my screen. Yes. So now do you see my screen with my laser pointer? Yes. Okay, thank you. So should I start? Wait, I think uh, okay. I was at least uh, welcome everyone first, but uh, um, maybe we can wait one more minute. Uh, no problem. Also, you should feel free to send out email invitation to someone. I, I saw that maybe you guys will do. I do try to email, but during the summertime, it's unpredictable whether which you know, people will be in the audience or not, whether they will attend. Mm -hmm. So you can send out more people if, if you want. Send out the email, uh, the seminar information. Okay, maybe we can uh, start. So uh, let's see, I think I have a YouTube log now. So welcome everyone. Maybe we can do recording as well. Let me do also with just a second. Welcome everyone, welcome to Harvard University CMSA, Center for Mathematical Sciences and Applications, Quantum Matter in Math and Physics Seminar Series. Today it's our great honor to have a, a rain home from Argonne National Laboratory and uh, Dominic Stukinger from Technische Universität Dresden. Uh, they will both uh, give a seminars today, uh, presumably one hour for each. 
and they will speak about probing the standard model of particle physics using the muon anomalous magnetic moment, the G minus two. And let's welcome directly a Rain Hong. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first here, I think uh, Zhu Wen Wang uh, invited me to be here to share our great news of our experiment. So probably from the title, you can tell uh, our experiment is about the mu anomalous uh, magnetic moment, and uh, we use it to probe the standard model of particle theory. And my talk will focus on the experiment side, and Dominic will talk about the theory side later. Uh, so probably you've heard about us in April already, because after our first release of the uh, result, we've got a lot of media coverage uh, all over the world, many different languages. And uh, our results are indeed uh, very exciting. And uh, we cannot declare there is a discovery, but indeed it's strengthened the evidence of a new physics beyond the standard model. So um, uh, long story short, uh, we measure a parameter called the mu anomaly, and uh, we use a mu to indicate that. And the, there is a previous version of the experiment at BNL Brookhaven National Lab, and our new measurement is consistent with the previous version of the experiment. And if we combine our expanded value together, and the error bar will shrink further, and the um, the deviation from the experiment average to the standard model calculation now is 4.2 sigma. So it's close to the five sigma threshold to declare a discovery of new physics, uh, but we're not quite there yet. However, uh, we have only analyzed 6% 6, 6 of the full data set we propose to take over the years. And we have already finished run two and run three. And now so it's uh, the run four is already done. So if all the other runs are analyzed, so we will keep improving this uh, experiment error bar. Uh, so in principle, the, if we keep the central value the same, uh, we, we will achieve the five sigma uh, threshold uh, soon in the next few years. So stay tuned. So uh, in my talk, I will first uh, have a brief introduction of what the magnetic moment is and what the G factor is and what the anomaly, and uh, also have a brief theoretical overview of how the mu anomalous magnetic moment is calculated in, in the standard model. And then I will focus on the experimental techniques like uh, the measurement principle and the uh, muon production and storage and how we measure the anomaly. And I will also talk about the details of the analysis. So we, there are two sides of analysis. So one is the uh, getting the precession frequency of the muon. The other one is magnetic field. So I will talk about them in details. And in the end, I will talk again about our run one results. So uh, for muon, it's a, a standard model uh, elementary particle. So it's a heavier version of the electron. So it has a, a charge and also has a spin. And the spinning charge in the standard model, it carries a so on magnetic moment, so we just treat the little particle as a charge that with uh, associated with a uh, little magnet. So the magnetic dipole moment mu can be expressed in this way. So the S is the spin uh, angular momentum, and uh, the E and the 2M, those are just constant factors here. And the G is a factor uh, that indicates, uh, indicates what the proportionality is. And so why we introduce these parameters there? Because um, if this, S is a uh, orbital angular momentum, then the G is one, but for spin it's, it's two. If the muon is indeed uh, a point-like particle in Dirac's theory, so G should be two. And uh, for other particles, if the, a, a particle like a proton, it's not a point-like particle, it has internal uh, constituents, so it's a mixture of uh, quarks and gluons, uh, so it has both a combination of spins and angular momentum, and then the G is not true. Uh, however, uh, later, if we consider the quantum fluctuations in quantum field theory, uh, the vacuum itself is uh, really not free of any uh, existence. It's, so uh, the quantum, uh, quantum uh, description of the vacuum is just the lowest energy uh, state of this uh, uh, interaction Lagrangian. Um, so, uh, in principle, you can have fluctuations. So here you can uh, pop up 
uh, positrons and electron pairs and uh, quark pairs uh, from the uh, from nothing. So if we consider the interaction between the muon and those virtual particles, then the G factor is not two. So basically, these virtual particles affect how a muon or an electron interact with the magnetic field. And so this was first discovered in experiments. So in 1947 experiment, people measured that the electron's G factor is 2.00238. It's a small deviation, but it is significant because the uncertainty is small. Uh, so Schringer later computes the, cor the, the correction factor based on quantum field theory. So this is the leading order term. So in Feynman diagram, uh, instead of just a point interaction, you can the incoming and outgoing electron can exchange a virtual photon there. So it forms a loop. So this first order correction is alpha over two pi. So alpha is the fine structure constant, one over 137. So if you put these numbers in, uh, you get very close to the uh, measured value in the experiment. So this is a great achievement in quantum field theory. Um, so so the, then we define the anomalous magnetic moment as the difference between the, the real magnetic moment and the ideal one. So basically G minus two, we, we call it anomalous magnetic moment. If we divide by two, so this is the, the uh, percentage change uh, or the ratio of the change relative to two. So we call that anomaly A. And so in our experiment, we measure the A of a muon. And so uh, later on, the experiment on the G factor for electron get also improved. So it can measure to the uh, you know, uh, 10 digits after the decimal point, it's the part per trillion level. And the, on the theory side, to really match that precision, people included more and more high order terms. So this is one loop. You can have two loops, three loops, and uh, also contributions from uh, other interactions like the electroweak interaction and the uh, strong interaction. Um, but uh, on the electron side, everything worked pretty well. So till now, the experiments still agree very well with the standard model uh, inter uh, prediction. Uh, so the next question to ask you is what the a, a anomaly for muon. So this is the second uh, lightest <coughs> lepton in the uh, standard model theory, so second generation particle. So, so uh, people just want to make sure this quantum field theory can apply to all the particles in the standard model. So to calculate a mu uh, to match the recent experiment precision, uh, so we need to include all higher order terms there. So besides the QED uh, contribution, only uh, electromagnetic interaction, the electroweak interaction contribution has to be calculated. And also the contribution from the QCD, uh, you know, virtual quarks and the gluon exchange. So if in any loop you have some hadron there, so it's just from the QCD. And uh, these QCD diagrams are the most difficult things to calculate. Uh, so we can categorize them into uh, two categories. So if you have a, uh, just a virtual photon links to the muon and in the middle have a blob of hydronic uh, <coughs> loops. Um, so we call this type of diagram the hydronic vacuum polarization HVP. If it is uh, you have three photons connect to a hydronic uh, blob uh, with another um, virtual photon there. So we call that hydronic light by light. So if you only look at this part, it's more like a a light scattered through a lot of quadronic interaction, and then uh, you emit two lights. So it's a light scattering through a quadronic interaction. Uh, so in real life, if they're real photons, it's not likely to happen, but they are, photo, uh, they are virtual photons, so uh, this could happen. And so the, uh, so far, the biggest uncertainty of this calculation is from the HDD calculation. So you can tell from this, uh, from this chart. So traditionally, uh, people use the so-called the optical theorem to connect this diagram to uh, something you can measure in experiment. So if you cut this part of the diagram in half, it's like a U, you can have the electron positron annihilated through a virtual photon and then you made all the uh, hadrons out. So if you measure the total uh, cross-section of such process, you can uh, calculate uh, the, this part of the diagram. And um, so um, using this, method, we can say the uncertainty of this diagram ultimately is also experimental uncertainty. 
And for the hydronic light by light part, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can only be done through modeling. So recently, people also tried to uh, find the, approach, the, the data driven approaches. So to relate that to experimental values. And also, the lattice QSD calculations are developed for that too. So, the recent years, the improvement of this part of the uncertainty is also a big achievement. Uh, however, if you combine everything together, so this is the recent um, situation of the theoretical calculations. And so we have a theory initiative uh, to uh, tell us which standard model value to compare to. So recently, the, their recommendation is to just combine the last most recent calculation to, to get the WP20. So this is the value we're comparing to. And so for, for everything above, they are not used in the WP20. So some are old and uh, you see all these uh, calculations of the HVP, they are purely based on the lattice QSP calculation. And for, for most of them, their error bars is not really competitive with this data-driven approaches. Uh, however, the most recent one, so the BMW20, that group released their results uh, right after we released our first experimental value. And uh, that's the first um, result that has a, you know, a comparable error bar with the data-driven approaches. So now the theory community is going to, uh, is really interested in this and uh, investigating this, uh, this approach. So th this result is kind of somewhere in between the standard model, uh, the traditional standard model prediction and our theory value. So we are not really uh, deviating from that very much, but uh, how trustworthy that is and whether they will be accepted uh, widely. So it's still, um, being discussed. So in the future, we will be clear uh, how to resolve this uh, tension between the calculation and the uh, previous data-driven method. Okay, so if we are really sure this uh, deviation is indeed uh, from something beyond the standard model, so uh, in, after we include everything we can find in the standard model, it's still there is a difference. Then it's a strong indication, or we can say we discovered something beyond beyond the standard model. And uh, why we use muon, not electron, and why it could happen the muon can uh, detect some interaction beyond the standard model, but the electron cannot. It's because the coupling with the very heavy beyond the standard model particles is scale that uh, mass square. So the muon is uh, 200 times more heavier than the electrons. So if you square, it's uh, 40,000 times more sensitive to the beyond the standard model interactions. So uh, there are many scenarios there uh, can cause a, a non-zero non um, deviation from the standard model value for muon G minus two. So here I just put a few diagrams of uh, uh, those virtual uh, supersymmetry particles. So our next speaker, Dominic, will uh, focus on this part. So he's a real expert on this uh, part of the theory. And in my talk, I will uh, just mainly talk about our experiment and how, we, how we've got that done. So this is our measurement principle. Excuse me, Ren. Yes. Uh, do you mind to also comment about the, uh, you, you mentioned the electric, electron and the muon, how about the tau G minus two? Uh, compare the enhancement that you showed in earlier slides. Maybe just remind uh, me. Yeah, yes. So the town G minus two in principle is more uh, sensitive, uh, but muon has the advantage that the half-life, the lifetime is about two microseconds. So uh, in accelerator systems, we boost it. So the lifetime observed in our experiment can be tens of microseconds. It's long enough for us to perform any meaningful experiment. And particularly, it's uh, long enough for us to do a precise determination. And for tau G minus two, the tau has a much, much shorter lifetime. So it's very difficult to um, really achieve a uh, precision really close to the muon G minus two. So that experiment was done, but the precision is not that competitive. So, you know, the muon is like a kind of sweet point. So it's easier to do the experiment and it has enough sensitivity to the beyond the sound model interactions. Uh, so that this answer the question? Oh, yes, thanks. But, but okay. that, mean, that means the experimental side is easier to perform, but in theory, or maybe in, in reality, maybe one can see more deviation. 
is that the what might one what might expect that? Uh, can you ask your question again? Uh, do we expect to see more deviation for the tau? tau? Uh, uh, I should say if there is a some beyond some of the particle much heavier, then the tau is more sensitive to it. So the deviation will be bigger, but just uh, the experimentally, yes, through tau, the right. precision is much worse. So you cannot tell. Okay. All right. So in theory, people still can predict anyway. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So this is our measurement principle. So first, let's assume we have a uniform magnetic field, so it's out of the page. And if you put a spinning magnetic moment into the magnetic field, and initially the uh, the momentum is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and the spin is aligned with the momentum, so it will start to precess. So we can calculate uh, how fast the uh, the momentum precess, so that's just the spectral from frequency. And you, we can also calculate how fast the spin uh, precesses. So uh, if you take the difference between them, so the difference we call that the omega a, and so that is directly proportional to a mu, the thing we want to measure. So if we can measure omega a directly, then uh, we can just measure the uh, a mu through this. So uh, it's just reading these diagrams. So if G equals two, then the momentum and the spin always align with each other. So if G is greater than two, then the spin is processing faster than the momentum. So they start to uh, deviate from each other. So we just use this effect to uh, measure omega A and a mu. So this is just a uh, normal procedure of the experiment. Uh, because mu decays, so we cannot uh, store them for a long time. So you have to produce them, and after they're produ produced, you just store them and immediately start the measurement. Then uh, if then we measure both the uh, um, omega A, so that's the so-called anomalous precession angular frequency, and also the magnetic field. And then take the ratio and put in these uh, uh, other constants like the mass and the charge, then you get a mu. So this is uh, just a long story short. This is our um, measurement principle. But in reality, uh, it's really hard to achieve an uh, ultimate uh, uniform field, and the beam is not always like this. So in the experiment, we have a lot of challenges. So I will talk about them uh, in the next few slides. So the, the, our, the previous version of the experiment at BNL, they produced the uh, muon through the proton beam. So the proton beam hit the target to create pions, and the pions decays into muons. And the, uh, the good thing is, after the production of the muon, the uh, spin of the muons are all aligned with the momentum uh, before you inject to the storage ring. Then uh, in this pipeline, you just let more pions decay and uh, get rid of the, the protons. You let it, uh, inject muon into the stored ring, then you just observe the uh, precession. And because the uh, muon decay is a random process, so just uh, observe one muon, you cannot tell which uh, orientation the spin is. Or, so in order to measure the spin, the, the, the spin direction or see the signal of the omega A, we need to make a histogram of something. We, we, can, we can talk about that later. But at least you need a histogram, you need statistics. So um, you need a lot of muon decays to achieve a higher statistical, uh, as, uh, okay, I should say better, uh, statistical uncertainty. So the BNL experiment is limited by the statistics. So it's five, uh, 540 ppb. Uh, the total detected uh, decay positrons is nine times 10 to the nine. Uh, so to get better statistical uncertainty, we should get more muons. And also if you keep using the same beam, which means you, uh, you have to just wait a longer time. So which is not a good idea. So that's why in our version of the experiment, we need to find a place so we have a better beam, more intense and cleaner, so to reduce both the statistical and the uh, systematic uncertainty. So we chose Fermilab. And so the, in Fermilab, um, we, our goal is to achieve 21 times more statistics. And so this in this facility, uh, we have a longer beam line to let all pions decay into muons. So we have a much cleaner beam. And it also has a four times higher field frequency than the Brookhaven. So basically here we have more muons per unit time to do our measurement. 
so we can achieve uh, 21 times more statistics with a reasonable uh, time frame. Uh, but a part of the experiment, which is the storm ring, is inherited from the previous experiment. So for that big magnet you see uh, in this slide, and so the, the, what you see here is just the insulation layer. Below it, you have uh, iron pieces and a superconducting ring. So iron pieces was uh, disassembled and shipped piece by piece to frame it up. But for this superconducting ring, uh, you have to ship it up as a whole. It's really difficult to disassemble and reassemble. And the shipment was also pretty challenging because uh, the superconducting coil is very brittle. So during the shipment, if the uh, deviation or the stretching between the two sides of the diameter is more than two millimeter. You can just break it. So uh, that company just uh, ensured us that this will not happen. So it's shipped from Brookhaven, from Long Island, uh, just along the coast, and then to the Mississippi River and go up the Mississippi River. So only for the last section um, near Chicago, uh, it's got on the land and is transported by a truck through the highways and eventually arrived at Fermilab. So a lot of people observed this event. So this is uh, this was a really exciting moment for us to continue our experiment. And our collaboration, the new one Chiman Tzu collaboration is uh, uh, really international. People are from seven different countries, uh, 33 institutions. And we, so now most recently we have two, uh, 200 three members. So this number fluctuates because people uh, come and go. And um, so different groups will really focus on different parts of the experiment, both the theory side and the construction of the experiment and analysis. So we, we need experts from all different areas, all different fields to make this happen because this involves both the detector technology and the accelerator physics and data analysis and also a lot of electronics uh, because we have tons of data to collect from our equipment and store them, analyze them. Uh, so it's, it's a big job for, you know, for, for many different aspects. And so this is the facility we produce the, the meal needed by our experiment. So this part of the accelerator complex was served for the Tevatron in Fermilab before the Tevatron was uh, decommissioned. So after the decommissioning of Tevatron, this part of the uh, accelerator complex is repurposed for other experiments, so mainly for the long baseline uh, neutrino experiments. And we share the proton beams with those experiments. Uh, so everything starts from the ion source near the Wilson Hall. And first there is a LINAP to accelerate the protons to 500 MeV. And uh, this yellow ring is a booster. It boosts up to 8 GeV. And then those protons are injected to the old recycler uh, to bunch them. So it will form many, many bunches. And then some of the bunches uh, will be delivered to a target, a constant target to create pions. So after the pions are created, uh, it will keep going and enter this so-called delivery ring. So this delivery ring was the antiproton source for Tevatron before, and they repurposed this building with uh, some modification of the beam line. So it becomes our delivery ring. So, uh, so at this point, it's still a mixture of protons and pions and muons. So, uh, this bunch will stay in the delivery ring for a few turns. And then uh, we wait for more pions to decay into muons. And the muon and the um, protons, they have the same momentum, but they have different mass. So they move at different uh, velocity. So after a few turns, the protons will be separated from the muons. And then we just kick out the, uh, the muons into our uh, experimental hall. So we have a really clean beam uh, with only muons, very, very few pions and no protons in our uh, stored ring. Um, there may be some very, very few protons, but that's not a big deal for our experiment. So just my message here is a really clean uh, muon beam and it's not trivial to get there. And after it's entered the experimental hall, so I will talk about our uh, facility. So this tunnel links to the, the upstream accelerator facilities. So our muon beam comes from this corner of our experimental hall. So this blue ring 
is the big ring magnet. And you can tell this uh, silver uh, colored aluminum co uh, shaped. So that's the cryostat of the uh, superconducting coils. If you look at the cross section of this magnet, so it's a C shaped magnet. Uh, so these uh, signs, these dots and the cross indicate the direction of the current in the superconducting coil. So it will create a uniform field in this area. And this iron yoke is to just to confine all the magnetic field lines inside this magnet so it doesn't leak out. And also these whole pieces will make sure there's a very uniform magnetic field in, the, uh, in between this gap. And there are a few components here you can adjust, like this uh, two, um, two hats, we, say, we call them top hat. So these pieces of metals can adjust, can be adjusted in the height. So the distance between the yoke and the hat can be changed. And the position of these pole pieces can also be changed. We have wedges in this gap. You can insert them and extract them just by a few millimeters. And on the edge, you have two uh, uh, some bumps in the edge of the uh, of the pole pieces. And also on the surface, we put a lot of iron uh, strips there. So all these components are used to shim the magnet into the desired uniformity. Because here we want really PPN level of uniformity of the magnetic field. And the shimming took us uh, uh, more than a year to, uh, to get our final goal. So this picture will show, uh, this little movie will show our effort of the last few months. So I will not show this part, only the last few months when we put in all the little iron pieces to achieve our final uniformity. So you can see, uh, you know, people just try to add one section, another section, and then implement the plan for the entire ring. So then we achieved a much better magnetic field, uh, more uniform magnetic field than the previous ex experiment, which is this uh, blue line. So the RMS of the uh, fluctuations or uh, non-uniformity is probably four times better uh, than the previous experiment. So that, that's the first achievement we made as the magnetic uh, measurement team. So in this experiment, I am for, uh, on the magnetic field side. So uh, shimming the magnetic field and measuring the magnetic field, that's what I was working on. Um, so after um, talking about the magnetic field, and I will talk about the uh, vacuum chamber. So after the muon is injected into our ring, uh, it will go in the um, uh, go around the ring inside the vacuum chamber. So the entire ring's vacuum chamber is just uh, connected uh, like a toroid shape of vacuum chambers. So we have twelve pieces uh, with the uh, flanges on both sides. We put them together and link them with the uh, bellows to make sure it's uh, uh, everything is aligned very well. So one challenge we faced at that time was the deformation under vacuum. So it's a big chamber. So if you pull vacuum and then the pressure from the atmosphere would deform it. And inside the vacuum chamber, we have a cage. And so it, it will give rails for the magnetic field scanner. So if we are not careful, um, this deformation will also distort this reels. So now you are not really scanning in a circle. Uh, this scanner will move in a very weird path. So that will introduce uh, systematic uncertainty. So, that, uh, so that's why we also spent a lot of effort just to make sure the vacuum chamber's deformation was uh, covered. So we installed these cages in a very special way, used some uh, screws tuned very well to make sure after we pull vacuum, the shape of the entire uh, rail for the magnetic field scanner is still a very uh, round circle. And the deviation from the circular path uh, was measured. Uh, so we can account for the systematic uncertainties related to it. So and uh, one I, yes. I question, what, yes. The colors, what, what, what do the colors imply in the, in the previous slide? Uh, the, the color? Yes, on, on, the, on the rings and also on, on the chamber side. The, the on the chamber, this indicates the deformation. So because um, you have the walls there, so after pull vacuum, that, that part deforms less. But in the middle here, when you're uh, further away from the wall, it deforms more. So the redder you see, the, the more, more deformation. And the colors here 
Um, so these uh, so sectors indicate the uh, the sections of the ring with the vacuum chamber, and these uh, greens are the ports, and also there are vacuum pumps there. So just different components we need to connect to the vacuum chamber. So here we have the ports for us to uh, connect to a pump or insert some um, devices into the ring to do certain measurement. So these are just ports of the vacuum chamber. Okay. Oh, by the way, I have a naive question. Uh, earlier, you, you have this uh, production of a muon from uh, maybe the nucleus proton decay to pion. No, not proton decays in pion. The proton hit the target and oh, this sorry, reaction, yeah, yeah they will that. produce pion. So that's a proton with other things in. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you wait, you need yeah. to wait billions of years. <laughs> And then, and then you have a pion decay to uh, muon. But yes. I, I wonder whether the, 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 there's also neutrino. So whether you need to worry about this. So it's a neutrino doesn't react to magnetic field. So it's a you know it's a band pass, and the neutrino just keep going. No problem. Okay, fine. Okay, so the next part of the story is the muon injection into the uh, uniform magnetic field. And so you can tell we have a uniform magnetic field, and uh, the uh, outside is just iron piece. So how do we get the field, uh, get the beam in? Uh, so this is a very interesting design. So at the injection point, there is a tunnel inside the iron piece. So so it, the iron is a very good magnetic conductor. So if you make a tunnel out of it, uh, the magnetic field in the tunnel is actually very very small. So the iron will just guide the magnetic field lines inside the iron piece, but in this tunnel, there's uh, almost nothing. It's just like a, you know, in electricity, you have a piece of conductor that they make a hole in the conductor, and it's it's shielded. So similar uh, similar concept. But here, you know, because iron is not a, uh, it's just like the superconductor for magnetic field, so you still have some remaining magnetic field, but that doesn't deviate this uh, beam that much. Uh, but the complicated thing is. Whenever you get into this uh, inner wall of this, um, this C-shaped magnetic field, the beam will start to see the strong magnetic field that could just deviate it. So this red line is the ideal storage orbit. So if you start to bend, what, whenever it passes this uh, inner wall, this uh, blue line, then uh, we're in trouble. So we can uh, shortly, it will just hit the inner wall of the vacuum chamber. So we, we built a device called the inflector. So what it does is it made another tunnel just inside this strong magnetic field to make sure in, inside the muon tunnel, it creates another magnetic field to fully cancel the magnetic field created by the uh, superconducting oil coil outside. So make sure the muon just keep moving without any magnetic field for about a meter and, uh, or, or so. And after that, after it's exit from the uh, inflector, suddenly you see the full magnetic field. Another thing is it, it does cancel the magnetic field inside it, but it could, should not disturb the magnetic field outside of it because we don't want to have a big bump in, inside the stored ring. So it needs a, a superconducting uh, shell there to really separate the inside field and outside field. So this is a critical component in our experiment to inject a muon beam inside our uh, stored ring. And, but you see this, it, the injection point is still at the, uh, at the radius larger than the ideal orbit. So it's not big, but it's still a few centimeters out there. So if you don't do anything after a full cycle, it will hit the back wall of the inflector. So to do that, we to correct this, to make sure the, store, uh, the muon beam is stored in the center orbit of our system. Um, after a quarter of the, of the ring, the muon is at the position of our uh, ideal orbit, but the momentum is not correct. It's towards the inner side of the ring. So there we put three pieces of uh, uh, kickers. So for the kicker, we just when the muon is there, we suddenly uh, just inject 5,000 amps through this pair of sheet 
to create a very strong magnetic field in the middle to adjust the momentum of the uh, injected muon beam. And after it's, uh, this turn, the photo second turn, we just turn it off. So this is indication only for the first turn, we turn on the kicker to adjust this momentum. So it's get kicked onto the correct orbit. And after that, it's just stored in the ideal orbit without hitting the inflector or anything else. So this is also a very critical uh, component of our experiment. And uh, personally, I can tell this is the most troublesome component in one one because 5,000 M uh, through this sheet is, uh, is, is not easy to handle. So we have to store a lot of energy in a uh, so-called broom line. It's like a, a cylindrical capacitor. Then we suddenly discharge it through this sheet of sheet metals and through um, through a few resistors, they can handle this big current and we burn a lot of resistors there too. Uh, but eventually after some effort, we get it onto a, ver a working condition and in run two and run three, uh, we have an engineering overhaul. So the, uh, the behavior of this crater get much stabler for the later ones. So uh, this is one thing um, that is not ideal in run one. And later I can also tell how much it affects our systematic uncertainty. There's a question from our yes. mm -hmm. So what about someone? Someone is raising. Please speak up. Uh, yes, I was asking uh, what the uh, injection velocity uh, or energy would be, uh, but uh, Dominic has told me that it would be about three GeV. Is that correct? Yeah, it is three GeV, and the velocity is close to speed of light. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to know whether there was any coupling between the spin motion and the orbital motion. Whether uh, you see that. Uh, what, what motion can you see again? Say the spin again. motion and the orbital motion, the cyclotron motion. Are there, is there any possibility of a coupling between the two? Was that uh, a consideration? Uh, the orbital motion and what? what the, spin, the spin motion, the spin precession. Uh, yeah, that's what we measure, the spin. Yeah, the, is there any possibility of a coupling between the two? Uh, the coupling between the two, yeah. um, there, 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 there is. So it's part of the uncertainty analysis. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so beam dy dynamics is very important factor of our analysis. So I will show that later. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, and then after we inject into the ring, we hit to the uh, correct orbit. So there is one more problem to solve. Because if you only have a magnetic field, is the motion is confined uh, in the horizontal point. So it's a circular motion, but nothing is confining them vertically. So usually people just use a uh, uh, quadruple magnet to confine the, the ver vertical motion to have the uh, focusing uh, magnets there. But here, we just want the uniform magnetic field. So the vertical uh, motion has to be confined using electric field. So that's why we have four sets of uh, uh, static electric, uh, electrostatic quadruples uh, to create a very strong electric field to uh, just push the beam towards the center vertically. And so meanwhile, it still creates a horizontal uh, defocusing force, but that doesn't matter because the magnetic field will do the horizontal focusing. So in, in the end, you have focusing force on both the vertical side and the horizontal side. And from now you can tell if you have a, a restoration force on both sides, it will end up with the oscillation. And this oscillation is also playing a very important role in our analysis, uh, which we don't want. So we want to reduce the oscillation, but we still need to take into account of it. Um, okay, so this is how we detect the muon decays. So the muon just uh, stored in the, in the ring uh, for a long time for many, many turns. And the spin is process processing too. And then uh, as they process, um, it will decay, decay into positrons. So the uh, emitted positrons has a lower um, momentum. So it will bend more towards the inner side of the ring. So we have an exit path for the emitted the positrons. And then we just put the detector right after this uh, exit path. So uh, this, this is part of the chamber, very thin wall aluminum. So it will not change the energy of the positron that much. So inside this uh, uh, detector uh, cabinet, we have an array of uh, lead fl uh, fluoride crystals. So these are uh, crystals where it can stop the positrons. When the positrons get stopped into, in this 
uh, crystal, it will generate the Chernikov radiation. And the Chernikov radiation can be detected by the silicon multipliers at the back of the uh, crystal. So uh, it will read out the electric signal like this. So whenever, uh, after each uh, hit, you will see a some of the crystal get triggers. So this is a calibration one. We just want to show what the signal is like in the, uh, in the crystals. And so we just register the hit time and the energy through uh, by integrating over this pulse. So uh, this is the our detector. So now it's the uh, okay. So just one more word about the det uh, detector. So the energy calibration of this detector is really critical because later we'll see we want to apply a threshold of the energy. So we then we count the pulse shots. So to make sure the uh, the gain of these detectors doesn't drift, we have a very complicated calibration system. So in this hut, we have a, a laser system. And then we fan out the lasers to each crystal. And then uh, we both measure the long-term stability and also the uh, short-term transient uh, uh, through a beam fill. So after we just fill the beam, uh, fill the beam in, so believe it or not, we, uh, we lose more than 90% of the muons. So because the, during the injection, it has a momentum spread. So this ring has a really small acceptance. So most of the muons just get scattered and then go out of this, um, uh, this ring and hit somewhere and generate a lot of particles that can hit our detector. So just right after the injection, all the detectors will see a big flash and this big flash will uh, change the gain of this uh, uh, detector because it suddenly drains a lot of current, it changes the bias voltage, it changes the gain. So we just at different times right after the injection, the laser is fired. So we can measure uh, what the change of the gain just during the fill. So this is a big correction we have to make. And after each hit with the real, um, the electron, the real electron after the beam is stabilized. After each signal, you drain some current, you also change the gain. So we, people also need to account for this gain change. So all these gain shifts are accounted for by this laser calibration system. And so the long-term uh, drift is also on the order to 10 to minus three, but uh, after we correct, uh, we can achieve 10 to minus four per hour uh, of the gain drift. So after we shift this, this is uh, uh, good for us when we do the analysis. So now uh, here comes the, uh, the interesting part of how we just, we can measure the spin precession uh, frequency omega a. So that's the anomalous precession frequency relative to the uh, momentum. So here, let's, uh, let me make sure everyone understands this. After, when we inject, it's a short pulse, but it still has a momentum spread. So after many, many turns, so these muons will just get uniform uh, distribution around the ring. So we just call the muon gas. So the, this, uh, these muons are uniformly distributed around the ring. And uh, so for each detector, it sees only a very small part of the ring. So this detector just watching this, uh, this uh, muon decays from only one second of the part of the ring. So, so basically, if you can use the detector to see the um, spin direction, so you just see, okay, the muons at that, uh, the muons at that position, you have the uh, spin spinning around this momentum because the momentum at this point is always in the tangent direction. So this is the picture. So we have a, a muon gas, and the, each detector is just watching part of the ring, and so in the muon's rest frame. And this decays through the weak interaction and due to the uh, parity violation, uh, the emitted electrons are mainly uh, emitted along the muon's spin. So the total for the high energy electron, for low energy, that's, a, that, that's different. But for high energy electrons, uh, because you have to make sure the, all the emitted uh, leptons are left-handed for particle and right-handed for uh, antiparticles. So they only, uh, they have a preferred direction. So this is a still a continuous distribution. It's not just along it or against it. So it has a, con uh, a continuous distribution uh, concentrated on the forward going direction. And in our lab frame, uh, these muons are ultra relativistic. It's three GeV, the, uh, the muons mass is only 200 uh, MeV. So uh, it has a um, large Lorentz boost. So if you emit a positron inside this muon's rest frame, so the Lorentz boost will 
make sure in the lab frame, all the electrons are just mainly forward going. However, this angle you emit the electron inside the rest frame determines the energy of the pulse proton in the lab frame. So this is through the Lorentz boost. And uh, so since we have a rotating muon, and so the distribution of the muon, uh, the electron direction is oscillating. So this will end up with a, a energy spectrum oscillation in the lab frame. So this shows, okay, see the muon is uh, spin is processing around the momentum. This energy distribution, energy distribution is the shape is just oscillating. And if we apply the thread threshold here, we only count the high energy uh, electrons we detect. Then you see the counting rate of the electron is oscillating at the frequency of omega a directly. Uh, so this is the advantage. This is how we can measure omega a directly in our experiment. Then uh, we observe this process for 700 microseconds, which is uh, about 10 times the uh, lifetime of a muon inside the ring. So after the Lorentz boost, the lifetime is about 60 or 70 uh, 